Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you also for showing up for the very last day. Um, I'll be talking about uh, some notions on the border between additive combinatorics and geometry. Um, all of what I present here is is based on joint work with a mix of people. Uh, this mix of people, to be precise. That's the way. Um, and there are uh, three notions that I would like to just remind you all of before diving into actual content. And the first is the notion of a sum set. The notion of a sum set is if you have two subsets of a uh, group, you take the sum of these two sets by taking all the pairwise sums of an element of the first set and an element of the second set. Um, yeah, then I want the, 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 the scalar growth is just if I take some parameter T and R, I'm just scaling up all the elements of the set with that particular element. And one example is that A will always be an A plus A over two, which I interpret to mean a half A plus a half A, um, <laughs> simply because every element will be the average of that element with itself. It's just a trivial, trivial inclusion. Okay, so let's uh, see some examples of, of where some sets appear. The famous uh, Goldbach conjecture that you might all know, uh, in terms of some sets can be very easily stated as every, uh, yeah, I like this expression, just saying the some set of the primes with itself cover all the even numbers except for two. Okay, let's consider two examples of, of sets and to, to see their some set. If I take some arithmetic progression with common difference D, the sum set of that set with itself is going to be another arithmetic progression with common difference d about twice as long. To be precise, twice minus one time. Um, on the other hand, if I take a geometric progression, the sum set is going to be considerably larger because every two terms will sum to a distinct uh, element. So the size of the sum set is going to be quadratic in the size of the original set. Now, with a little bit of thought, you might see that this is, in fact, the largest that a sum set can be. Uh, with a little bit of more thought, you might see that actually the arithmetic progression is the smallest that a sum set can be. So what I want to talk about is additive structures, essentially saying, if the sum set is small, what sort of structural properties can I find about this set? Now, one notion that is closely related is the notion of convexity that you probably all have encountered before, but very basically, what does it say? A set in Rn is convex. If I take any two points, every average will also lie in my set. Or to be more precise, it means that the entire line segment between two points in my set will be a subset of the set. Um, I can formulate this in terms of subsets by saying that this weighted average set between the set and itself will be a subset of the set, and in fact, will be the set itself. OK. Um, now, what I would like to do is I would like to take a set and look at the convex sets that relate to it. And the most natural convex set that relates to a set is going to be the convex hull, which is the smallest convex set that contains a given set A. Um, and this nicely happens to actually be the intersection of all the convex sets containing a set A. So this notion of convex whole will, will come back a few times. And right, yeah. And now there's one more one more notion that I would like to import, remind you of before before actually starting to say thing, which is the, the notion of stability, which of course was in my title. So what is the basic notion of stability? Well, to, to think about stability, I want to think about inequalities in a very general sense. So what is an inequality? It just says. Um, I have two parameters of some object A, and one is bigger than the other for all objects A in my class. And now to go one step further, I can classify the set of elements for which there is equality in this inequality case. So this is the, the extremal problem related to an inequality. Uh, and the stability is to go one step further and say, OK, maybe I don't quite have, inequality, quite have equality, but I have almost equality. To what extent does that mean that my uh, sets must be, in some sense, close to the extremal examples? So can I slightly extend my class of 
extremal examples to include everything that obtains almost uh, equality. And can I make this, this family F delta uh, as small as possible? Okay, so let's let's consider a specific example, maybe an inequality that people will have seen before, the isoparametric inequality in the plane. So what is the isoparametric inequality in the plane ask? It says, if I give you some area, what shape should I make that will have this area that will minimize the perimeter? And specifically, what is the smallest perimeter that I can obtain? Now, there is a nice expression for this. And maybe I, I suspect all of you know, like this, this stuff is ancient, like literally ancient. So I suspect you're familiar with this, that the answer is a disk. That's the best shape I can form. So I find the inequality, specific form, and I find the extremal result that if I have the minimal boundary, then indeed I must be a disk. And now what does the stability result say? The stability result, or one of the stability results, says, let's say I have almost equality, which means that this term here is small, right? Like compare it with the, with the inequality itself. If my term on the left-hand side is only slightly bigger than the term on the right-hand side, so this difference is small, then this term here is small. Now, what is this? I would like to measure how far my set is from a disk. And to that end, I introduce two parameters, the in radius and the out radius. So the out radius is the smallest radius of a circle that contains my entire set. And the in radius is the biggest um, circle that is contained inside of my set. Now, it might be clear that if my set X is a disk, these two will just coincide. So the differences between these two radii might be used as a measure for how close our set is to a disk. Is the bonus and equality true for non-convex sets? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Is the bonus and equality true for non-convex sets? Um, uh, I know it's for convex sets, but I... Right. Uh, I was also thinking of convex sets. I guess I didn't specify that. I, I guess in general it should not be true because just taking out tiny bits inside will oh, massively reduce your in radius without really affecting your person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stay away. Yes. Yeah, sorry. So I should have specified that X is a comment. Yes, thank you. Well, the Wikipedia just that the boundary has the Jordan curve. According to Wikipedia, the scientific uh, that the boundary is a Jordan curve. Aha, aha. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right, very well. Now, why do I take this example? Well, for one, because I, I hope it's an inequality you're familiar with. The two, because the isoparametric inequality, in a way, is a subset inequality. Because if I want to think of the perimeter in the following way, it's actually sort of a subset. So basic idea is if I give you some, let's say, convex shape in the plane, and I add a tiny little ball with radius epsilon to it, then I can find the perimeter by just adding this little ball and subtracting the original set. And what I get is this slightly thickened boundary. And as I let epsilon tend to zero, this will be a measure of the size of the perimeter. Okay, so now with this in mind, uh, what, is, what, is, what is the fundamental question of isoparametric inequality? It's trying to minimize this sum here. Okay, and now this brings us to the Brumikovsky inequality. The Brumikovsky inequality is, is, is the, in a way, most basic uh, sum set inequality in Rn. It says that if you give me two subsets in Rn, let's say they're, they're sufficiently uh, well behaved, let's say they're, they're, they're finite unions of cubes, uh, and I take some parameter between 0 and 1, then they're weighted, and the two sets have the same size, then their weighted average is always going to have at least the size of the individual bodies. With equality, if and only if A and B are up to translation and up to a measure 0 set, the same set, and that set is actually a convex set. Okay, so what do stability results of this Brumikovsky look like? Well, I've told you the inequality, I've told you the equality case. 
And I would like to quantify to what extent, if this is almost an equality, this extremal condition is almost attained. Now, there's many directions in which you can do this. You can think about how similar are A and B to each other, how convex are they, and how similar are they to the same convex set. Um, now, we have results in all of those, but I will state the, the, the easiest one to digest. Um, for the specific case where I already assumed that A and B are the same set and this weighing factor is actually a half. So it's very the cleanest, cleanest case of all, in which I say that if the average is close to minimal, so it would be minimal if this was one, and now it's only a tiny bit, uh, a tiny bit larger, then I can bounce the distance to the convex hole of A in terms of um, the distance to equality. Notice that this measures exactly the distance to equality up to some dimensional constant. Now, this is an accumulation of uh, um, a lot of results over time. In one dimension, it was, it was found by Freiman. Uh, in dimensions two and three, by Figali and Jerison. And uh, myself with Hunter Spink and Marius Tiba settled it for all dimensions. And in a very recent result, uh, we established uh, how far you can move away from equality for this uh, bound to still hold. Now, before I finish, I want to say a few things also about why I mentioned discrete um, <laughs> results in, in, in the title, which is I want to relate this result to something called Freiman's theorem in additive combinatorics, which is a structure result about sets uh, in the integers for which the sum set has bounded size. Now, notice that here I just say bounded size for, for any lambda. So it's, it's way bigger range than the result that I mentioned before. But the main thing to note is that in the case that I have bounded sum set, I can cover A uh, by X plus P, where X is a set of a bounded number of translates, and P is a generalized aromatic progression. Now, what the generalized aromatic progression is just a sum of aromatic progression. It doesn't matter too much what it is. The basic idea is that I can cover it by a bounded number of nicely structured sets that are not too large. Um, and let me mention one specific, specific extension of this is that fighting for the, the, the quantitative dependencies in these constants is a big battle in additive combinatorics. And one specific one that I would like to highlight is Freiman Bilu, which says that here I can take the logarithm of lambda to be the dimension of the set. Now, how to interpret this? Let me interpret this by, by bringing this to the context of Rn, where it says that if I have a set whose doubling is, is less than two, so notice that before I, I said one plus something really small here, now I have one plus quite, something quite big, um, then I can cover my set A by a bounded number of parallelotopes of bounded size. Um, Okay, and that, that brings me to, to, to my final slice, uh, which is how I like to bring these together, trying to take this idea of, of considering a broad range of doublings. Um, That's one question. The 1.9, if any constant below two? Yeah, 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 yeah. I put 1.9 because the, the constants actually depend on the distance also to two. So as you get to two, these constants get worse. It, it might be completely obvious, but I don't immediately see it. Like, if it was 2.1, the theorem would be obviously closer. Yeah, yeah, because then A could be an arithmetic progression of convex sets, in which case they're the, of arbitrarily long length, so that you couldn't do it with a bounded number of sets. Yes. Um, so let me mention one, one result in this direction. So the idea being take the broad range of doublings and somewhat weaker information from the additive side and the maybe convex, more precise information from the continuous side and prove a result um, for a broader range of doublings. So the range doubling all the way up to two. Um, and find a very precise result saying that if my doubling is, is bounded away from two, 
I can find a convex set of bounded size that actually covers uh, almost all of A. So a single convex set that covers almost all of A. It's constant. So the constant here is one before we had a constant here that depended on dimension here, doesn't depend on the dimension. And as, sorry, uh, as epsilon tends to zero, this is actually a sharp result. Um, yeah, let me end there. Right. Well, your proof in higher dimensions. Yeah, yes. <laughs> but I have Freiman's methods. Sorry, sorry. Are your methods similar to Freiman's or different? Um, so I, I just use Freiman as a black box essentially. Yeah. And in that kind of work? Um, no, no induction. By the way, he passed away last week. Right. Oh, really? Oh, sorry to hear. Oh, he was, he was 96 or something. Yes, he had a good life. <laughs> Any other questions? Good topic. Okay, thank you.